sort of the, the flavor of stuff that we, we write, and you'll hear a wide variety of things coming up, but uh, we have, uh, uh, when we first got to town, we uh, uh, went to all, all of the writer's nights and uh, uh, played with uh, lots of different uh, musicians in town, and uh, we managed to, to get our first meeting with an executive in the industry who uh, agreed to hear some of our material and so he he listened to a couple of our songs and he said I like it I really like it but who are you going to sell that to <laughs> so there you have it and when they asked that question <laughs> so we went out and bought a farm we went up and <laughs> Who are you going to sell that to? But that's only one opinion. We love your music. Well, yeah, yeah. So that was early on. We, we've been here since 1994. And uh, that would be 20 years. This is a landmark year for us. Uh, Carol and I got married in 1994. And she dragged me here to Franklin, kicking and screaming. Didn't she, Jean? Yeah. Yes. <laughs> Jean is my mom-in-law, yes, so uh, <laughs> she's one of our avid supporters. Um, I, this song I put in because it's a story about uh, someone who really likes our music. Every year before our music festival, the Blackberry Jam, we go on the local radio program several weeks beforehand, and then the Friday before the jam, we usually get on and we perform something. Well, Tom Lawrence loves this song. In fact, Tom Lawrence refers to this song as 
the song that bought the farm. <laughs> I don't know why. <laughs> I really don't. I just really don't want to ask him. <laughs> I'll do my impression of Tom. Well, Dale. <laughs> Tell us. I'm going to throw you a curveball now. <laughs> what was the name of the song that bought Boyd Mill Farm? <laughs> I didn't know quite what to say. What did we say, Carol? We just sang it. We just sang the song. <laughs> here in, in the house this evening. Uh, great supporters and once again they help us out in an emergency. We had a guitar we had a guitar that had a flat tire. Uh, we didn't have a spare so uh, Joel Ulmer, our good friend had a spare guitar and uh, we were able to use that. And his lovely wife Leanne Joel and Leanne have a 
wonderful uh, music group. They call themselves Two Country for Nashville. I'm sure you've heard of them. And they're right here in the audience with us today. <laughs> Uh, this song was written about uh, my growing up in a little town called Farmville. The real one, not the one on Facebook. Yeah. <laughs> Lots of farmers, hence the name Farmville. This was in central Virginia. And uh, I had a 65 Mustang that I drove way too fast. And uh, <laughs> you say you have one too, you drove way too fast. Well, there you go. <laughs> They were kind of prone to be driven way too fast. Well, uh, in Farmville one night, uh, uh, I was really bored. It was like dead of winter, nothing going on. No music, no nothing. And so uh, I just decided that I would drive my car backwards through town just to see what would happen. <laughs> Brilliant. You know, 17, 18 years old, you never know what that age is going to come up with. So I uh, drove backwards through town. You know, went about two blocks, nobody, nothing. And I get in front of the police station. There's a guy sitting, you could see, they had a, a, like a plate glass window there, you could see into the station, there was a guy watching like reruns of Andy Griffith. And I'm out, out there going backwards down the street and he has no clue. So uh, I'm like, okay, well, I'll just keep going and see, what's ha see what happens. So I wound up going about three more miles uh, until I got to the Hardee's and didn't see a soul. So, you know, I'm the only one who knows the story. <laughs> But uh, I was born in that little little town at Southside Community Hospital, right there in good old Farmville, Virginia. So this has a little bit of, of the aspects of driving through town backwards and being born right there in Farmville.
I can live with less if it comes with this view. I can live with less if it comes with this view. I can live with less if it comes with this view. I can live with less if it comes with you. Since it's about Franklin, we're going to attempt to do that poem for you today. a line laid in, a turn of phrase, a motif, pause and wonder, the key set before our time, but time nevertheless, point and counterpoint, pre-suburban. Franklin, Tennessee, and Andy Jackson's only face-to-face -face meeting with the Chickasaw chief, eye to eye, a pause and whisper, words turning from breath to wind and silence, the beginning of the Indian Removal Act. A lament of shame and sorrow for a hundred years. Later still, 
past West Main, the Carter House, blood in, blood out. The Carter's son, captured by Union, escapes in Pennsylvania, re-enlists in a year before the war ends, in the Battle of Franklin is shot, 200 yards from his home, and in four days, dies. Blood in, blood out. Always the strange way that leaving is but a returning to, a line laid in and turned. through us, these semitones of memory among the stations of the dead. to telling stories about songs and what we do without mentioning the flood. <laughs> we actually have not written a lot of songs about the flood. The next two are the only ones that it's even remotely mentioned. Um, you want to tell your story? About what? <laughs> this one has the two dimes in red. Oh, this one? Yeah. Oh, yeah. If I don't choke up doing this one. Uh, this is my wedding band, and uh, obviously it's not on my finger because I'm a bit bigger than I was when we got married. You know? <laughs> so so uh, uh, I used to keep <laughs> I used to keep my wedding band in uh, a wash stand uh, in uh, the bathroom, and uh, when the flood happened, uh, it took everything in the house and just whirled it around like it was in a huge hurricane, and. Uh, this wash uh, stand uh, got completely dumped. All the contents were completely gone. And in the melee of uh, trying to tear everything out of the house and get stuff out and, and get it prepared to be put back together, um, I had, hadn't even thought about my wedding band, you know, in and amongst everything. And about two days into it, Carol comes up <coughs> taking a break out in the backyard. And she goes, I don't know if you've thought about this, but um, We've been trying to find your wedding ring. I was like, I started crying. I was just bawling. And uh, so they, they brought this uh, wash stand out, and uh, the drawers were hanging out, nothing in it, you know. Everything was gone. And so uh, you know, we carried on, you know, pulled up, <coughs> pulled myself up by the bootstraps, and just kept on going. And uh, a couple of days after that, one of the last pieces of furniture that was getting ready to get tossed and in, into, the, into the bin was this uh, wash stand. And I said, Carol, let's just take a hammer and a crowbar and tear that thing completely apart, just on the chance that my ring might be in there. So we start tearing it apart, and sure enough, right in the very bottom corner, you know, tore everything apart, right in the bottom corner, in a chunk of mud, Two dimes in my wedding. <laughs> we started crying again, hugging. And hugging. Anyway, true story. So uh, I said, you know, uh, just get me a, get me a, a chain here, and I'll, I'll put that on, and I won't take it off. So uh, I've had people go, Dale, why don't you get that ring sized and you know, you know, for your bigger finger. 
And I said, I would much rather resize me and get back down to me. To me. That's the goal. So, uh, you know, that's a goal I've set for myself, and uh, it's been some 75 years now, and I haven't done it yet. <laughs> we'll get there. Slum and steady wins the race. Isn't that right? This is a new song, and it's called Perfect. I won't tell you that it's also about putting in a gas tank. <laughs> I didn't want to pick the wrong song. <laughs> I do have a tendency to take off on the wrong song once in a while. Yeah, see? There you go. Yeah, it's that one. <laughs> Oh, he's in the right key. Yes, we're in the right key. Uh, that's why we have editing, thankfully.
audience we have here. Thank you so much, and uh, thank you so much to the uh, library for having us uh, uh, come out and play and, and be able to share some uh, music with you and a little bit of, about ourselves. Uh, I'm a piano technician by trade. I do piano tuning. Oh, okay. Okay. I got, I got a public service announcement from the stage right that I should change my guitar yeah. before I crank it into another song. <laughs> so, uh, where was I? Piano. Oh, yes. I'm a piano technician by trade. And uh, I've been doing that type of work for about 30 years, 35. And uh, I work for a company here in town called Seal Keyworks. And uh, I've been with them for about four years. But uh, the uh, piano work has uh, uh, brought me a, a wide variety of opportunities to meet a lot of different people. And uh, I have uh, actually had the opportunity to go out on tour uh, for a brief period of time. I toured with Clint Black uh, for about five years uh, as a technician. Uh, he had a grand piano. Uh, that he took out on the road with him, and I took care of that grand piano. And uh, uh, over the, the period of five years, uh, I got to know the band pretty well. And uh, I did have the opportunity, uh, in a, about the third year in, uh, I was also guitar tech for the rhythm guitar player. And um, he fell ill. Uh, and so, uh, I was able to stand in for the rhythm guitar player and was only supposed to be for a couple of shows, wound up being the entire summer. And so I was, uh, in, in a backdoor fashion, uh, was able to be a part of the band and they were very gracious. Uh, just a wonderful group of people, treated me like family and Clint was, uh, was wonderful and uh, continues to be friends and uh, very supportive. Uh, so that was uh, uh, a period I'll, I'll never forget. It was about a five year stretch and Carol put up with my being away from home for long periods of time and uh, took care of everything essentially while I was gone. So thank you, buddy. <laughs> Good job. <laughs> All right, switching guitars. Talk to him, baby, talk to him. <laughs> <laughs> When he talks about what I was taking care of while he was gone, for those of you who don't know, we are the owners of Boyd Mill Farm. It's a, you pick blackberry farm, we have blackberries and raspberries. Other than the music festival, we also um, provide all kinds of other services. We, we are open for weddings, for um, showcases, and various other things throughout the year. For a long time after the flood, it took a long time for the berries to recover, and I have to say that they look really, really good and they enjoy the cold weather, so that's awesome. Um, but after the flood, it probably was two years before we wrote anything, except for one song. And so this is our one song that is just strictly and completely about the flood. And it's a real appropriate one for the library because it's called Words Won't Come.
unpredictable skies. Dig in the dirt, carry the tune. friend back uh, in Virginia who was a uh, great, great guy. He's still around, don't get me wrong. I've talked about him in the past tense, but uh, I would say that uh, as wily as this guy is, he's, I'm sure he's still around. Uh, but uh, uh, he was uh, uh, sort of a wild character and uh, had that reputation. And uh, he and I uh, talked one time and, and just got onto a little bit more of a, a, a sensitive level. And uh, uh, he was talking about how he had been heartbroken and uh, it had been uh, quite a bit of time uh, since he had uh, been close to anybody in a relationship and uh, uh, really kind of struck me how he kind of opened up and talked about it a bit. And uh, uh, that didn't last long. Uh, <laughs> then it was like, hey, let's go bowling. Uh, so, but I did write a, write a song. This is called Glass Jaws and Stainless Steel Hearts. And um, 
Uh, it has uh, some uh, lyrics uh, that have become rather dated, uh, I think. Um, uh, glass jaw is uh, a term, a boxing term, for somebody who is very easily uh, punched out, you know, lights out, glass jaw. They have a glass jaw. They uh, just can't take a punch. You know, a couple of hits to the head and they're on the mat. And uh, uh, there's a, another line in here about... Um, uh, life and relationships sort of going through the ringer. Oh boy, they've been through the ringer with that. And uh, that's an old term from an old washing machine, right? They used to, the clothes used to, you know, you do them in the, the tub and they go through the ringer. You don't have any idea what a ringer is. You do? No, not, we're not cracking ice cream. Yeah. <laughs> I'm just messing with you. I can tell you. <laughs> that's it. Bingo. And for the bonus point, yeah. how do you keep your hand from going in the ringer? Wow. My parents grew up with that stuff. So do I. Here we go. I know a man who for 17 years gone without a lover in his heart And it's not as though the chances haven't come He's just so afraid of being blown apart Glass jaws, stainless steel hearts Always come through
Yeah, pick it up. That one. You guys have been a really great audience, but we feel it's time that you need to sing along. <laughs> no, you don't know this song, but you will very quickly. Yes! <laughs> this, is, this is our song about the weather, about religion, and about politics, all rolled into one. The chorus, the part that you will be singing, the lyrics are really simple. You can repeat after me. Ooh, the sky is falling. Ooh, the sky is falling. Very good. You'll see where it comes in. Just jump right on in. Close to country as we were. That's it's as bad as close to country. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, enough of that hippie stuff. Y'all played some country. Come on. Took a I song am, uh, to influence you, huh? 
Take us this long to influence you. Well, you know, it's, it's, like it's, like it's like a fine wine, you know, it, it takes a while. Bill has a potato cannon. Yeah, yeah, I'm kind of yeah. thick headed too. Potato so. <laughs> Make sure the gas pedal's all the way down. I tried to write country music when I first came to town, and um, I just didn't get it. I, I couldn't do it, and I banged my head against the wall for a couple of years. And starved to death. No, I didn't starve to death, uh, but it was, it was quite frustrating, and I told Carol, I said, you know, I, I, can't, I can't really do this. I, uh, I just have to write what I feel, kind of write from my my background, which is rock and roll and folk music and, and that kind of stuff. And uh, so we have uh, continued our, our day work. Um, Carol is a piano teacher by trade and uh, does that full time. And I'm the piano technician, I do that full time. And we have the farm. And we play, manage to play a little music once in a great while. So uh, we really appreciate you folks giving us the opportunity to, to play some music. It's a very cool thing. Thank you.
As some of you, as uh, Catherine said at the beginning, we host the Blackberry Jam Music Festival. This is our 11th year. And just to give a shout out with it, uh, we've got a very great lineup this year, but our favorite part is three-time Grammy Award winner, Ashley Cleveland is our headliner. <laughs> very excited. But part of what the jam does is we have a tendency sometimes to jam a little bit. And this is one of those songs that we end up jamming with. Paula. Paula. Yes. Yes. The name of this song is called Hey, Shy, Paula. And we could use some Paulettes if you guys want to. Yes. Uh, uh, the way this song came about, um, uh, we were on our way uh, to Little Rock uh, to visit some friends. And there's not a whole lot between Memphis and Little Rock. It's real flat, kind of boring. Is it in, in the Osborne Brothers Museum in there somewhere? I think it is. And, uh, but uh, we, we were riding along an overpass in huge letters. Someone had gotten out there with a spray can and it said, Hey, Shy Paula. It wasn't Bobby Loves Jane or you know, anything like that. It was Hey, Shy Paula. And so uh, we did get a song out of it. Seriously, come sing. <laughs> this is another sing along, and uh, at the at the end you'll you'll catch on because this one is a really hard one too. It's Hey Shy Paula. Hey Shy Paula. A shy Paula, a shy Paula, a shy Paula. Hey, shy Paula. Yeah, it's Hey, shy Paula, not Who Shot Paula. <laughs> we have some people that go, Hey, y'all played that Who Shot Paula song. <laughs> We, yeah, that would make we it a really like song. that. <laughs> <laughs> Who shot Paul? No. Hey, shy Paul. Such a shy young girl.
Being here on a Saturday afternoon, you could do anything else, but we really are glad you're here. And uh, thank you very much, uh, Catherine, for uh, giving us a very nice introduction, and uh, uh, to the library for having us. Uh, it's a very cool thing. Uh, this song was written by a friend of ours. Uh, his name is Colin Linden, and uh, it's titled Sugar Mine. Sugar Mine. A little bass, a little more bass. Yeah, yeah, it's more bass. <laughs> Sweet home, 
ago, only one curbside recycling program existed in the United States. Today, this country recycles 32% of its waste. That's a rate that has almost doubled in the past 15 years. That's 50% of all paper. 34% of all plastic soft drink bottles. 45% of all drinking cans. 63% of all steel packaging. And 67% of all major appliances. For every ton of paper recycled, 17 trees are saved. By recycling one glass bottle, you save enough energy to light one light bulb for four hours. 
Hello, I'm Mr. David Scalar, and this is my AP Environmental Science class at Centennial High School. Today we're going to track from its manufacture through its consumption, and then down in one of two paths, either by its disposal, where it's taken to a landfill, or through its rebirth into another product by showing how it is recycled. We begin at Purity Dairy of Nashville, Tennessee. Milk for the plastic gallons comes by truck from dairy farms. At a receiving bay, it's weighed and unloaded into silos where it's stored. All milk products are thoroughly lab tested for quality. The milk passes through 2,500 pounds of pressure in a homogenizer that disperses butter fat, then through a blend tank and pasteurizer. Simultaneously, the plastic jugs are being molded from fingernail-sized beads into gallons in what's called the blow mold room. Excess plastic is reground and used again. Milk and plastic meet in a filling process. The product is labeled and sent to a staging area where it awaits shipping to a loadout dock. Here, 175,000 plastic gallons are shipped out every day. The consumer has two options in disposing of the plastic. The first is to throw the gallon away in a waste can. The plastic jug finds itself at a landfill. Here it is dumped and loaded into a trailer to be taken to another landfill. There it is buried where it can take up to 450 years to decompose. Furthermore, the majority of today's landfills are sealed, essentially oxygen-free, and are given little or no water and sunlight. This can prolong the plastic gallon's decomposition even more. This landfill ships a minimum of three 20-ton trailer loads of waste per day. Sometimes they can ship up to six. That's up to 240,000 pounds of trash sent to be buried in just one day. Or the consumer can choose option two to recycle the plastic milk gallon. Recycled material is taken to a convenience center where it is picked up and sent to a recycling center.
At the recycling center, plastic, aluminum, paper, glass, and appliances are separated. Plastic bottles and containers are crushed and bundled. This plastic will be sent to Georgia, where it will be melted down and reused in making a new plastic product. Recycling saves natural resources, energy, and our environment. It is our responsibility to protect the planet and ensure its well-being for the future. By recycling, we can all reduce our ecological footprint. By recycling, you can lessen your impact also. Welcome to Poets from the Neighborhood. I'm Erin Glass. And I'm Victoria Clausey. We hope you enjoy the poems we'll be reading to you today, poems that were written by your friends and neighbors. The first poem is titled, Io Underwater by Erin Glass. Oceans, pastures, know the loneliness of being everywhere at once. Tonight, I have tunneled through the half-eaten stars to the most remote side of an octopus moon. This poem is a letter to tell you there is no home for us here either, or time enough to love without the fear of being too much or not enough of one thing. How do I say it? In this language, there are no words for how a cloud collapses, no road through the volcanic plumes, no sleep to close the peacock's eye. If you need me, I'll be this, dragging our out pa the past and painting it blue. But like the tooth that plunges out from the narwhal's head, I cannot tell you why. Desert Dark Child by Susie Sims Irvin. Desert Dark Child, running knotted joints toward speeding tourist bus, drawn as a gnat to twin beams of light. Desert Dark Child, trailing red tatters from your slender mast, bleeding your purpled shadow, lengthened to absurdity into still warm sands, stretching spindly fingers to gather to your tiny breasts, bouquets of cascading nothingness. Desert dark child, I hear the silence of your futile cry, mimic echoes of this barrenness, I feel the frailty of your dirty fingernails scrape deep trenches across my hollow heart, my desert dark child. This poem was written by 10-year-old Amanda Kate Danley. Raise your hand if you aren't here. Raise your hand if you're not here, the teacher said at the beginning of the year. Megan's not here, Courtney said. Next time, Courtney, raise your hand. But I'm here, Ms. Wimberly, Courtney said. Okay, then don't raise your hand if you're not here. Nobody raised their hand. Well, since I don't have a class, I have the day off. She ran out. So do we, the class said. They ran out too. Then Megan walked in. Hi, sorry I'm late. From an ongoing argument with the Times by Jeff Harden. How long since you climbed the oak tree's reach for sky? How long since you crouched to hide your face in the long flowing cross-hatched swaying of sage grass? Hmm. So what if the mailman sees you? He secretly wants to read all the letters and speak as an intimate while the store clerk weighs the seedless grapes. There was a time once, remember, you slipped out on water and set the oars to rest, the canoe like a thought that held you tucked inside. Over the tree line and then two hills you could walk, 
all the way to the river and still be back before a soul would know you'd gone. You could do this every day. In another month or two, you'll lower northern windows. For now, cicadas ride the limbs of every tree for miles. It's a long way back, even from the last conversation you had. Right Fielder by David Harris. Neat's foot oil and leather, pounding ball into glove, wrapping glove around ball, marrying with a book strap, teaching ball and glove to belong together, binding the tools of summer to their tasks, possibilities, and prospects, binding myself to baseball. In March, we are all dreamers. This poem was written by nine-year-old Amanda Danley. Spring, trees beautiful with blossoms and fresh green leaves, ponds full of tadpoles and frogs, Grass, wheat, and dandelions all waving in the wind, raining day after day, but finishing in beautiful spring colors of a rainbow. Thank you for watching. We hope you'll join us again soon for Poets from the Neighborhood.